Good day, everyone. I am Brenda Muñoz, the conference coordinator of LMDA Conference 2021. And I am happy to welcome you all to the Canadian and Mexican Artics, Artist Exchange. Uh, this panel will be presented in English and Spanish. So remember that we have oral simultaneous interpretation available through the Web Switcher Pro app. You can download that in your phones or gadgets. And one of our amazing volunteers will introduce the token to log, to log in to that on the chat box. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Brenda Muñoz, coordinadora del Congreso LMDA 2021, y me da gusto bienvenirlos al panel Intercambio Artístico México-Canadá. Este panel será presentado en español e inglés, así que recuerden, por favor, que tenemos acceso a interpretación oral simultánea a través de Web Switcher Pro. Pueden descargar esta app en sus teléfonos o gadgets, Y ahora uno de nuestros voluntarios introducirá el token de acceso en el chat. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Welcome, guys. The panel is yours. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you for all your hard work on this fantastic conference. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Balachi. She, her. I'm coming to you from uh, the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, aka North Vancouver. It's a suburb of Vancouver, just north, very aptly named. Um, and I am the board president of LMDA Canada. Uh, I am going to be facilitating today's conversation. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to provide just a little bit of context. Um, now, I think all of this started actually a couple of years ago um, at the Chicago conference when Brenda, uh, who you just saw a moment ago, asked for my advice coming from, you know, LMDA Canada as she was setting up LMDA Mexico, the new kind of entity of LMDA Mexico. Uh, and it got me thinking that there's a lot in common between LMDA Canada and LMDA Mexico and their relationship to larger LMDA. But I had a feeling there was also a lot of co a lot in common between Mexican and Canadian theater artists and dramaturgs in general. So I took this to my colleagues, Danielle and Pedro, who you'll meet in a moment. And we kind of came up with the idea of doing a Mexican artist exchange um, at the Mexico City Conference. I mean, our original idea was in person last year, but of course, for obvious reasons, there were a few pivots. Um, so this year, we dreamed up uh, this kind of panel discussion um, uh, that you'll be seeing today, of course. Um, so how it's going to work is I'm going to give uh, each of our six panelists, our six artists here, about five or so minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, their work, any questions they have uh, at the moment, um, anything they have on their minds. Uh, and then I have a few kind of starter conversation questions to get the kind of discussion flowing. But ideally, it's just going to kind of go from there and everyone will kind of be free flowing chatting between um, them. And then we'll start taking questions from the crowd, as it were, you all. Um, and you can pop your questions, as I understand, you can pop your questions in the, if you're on WebEx through Q&A, uh, or you can also tweet your questions. Um, they'll all be kind of fed to us here and there. Uh, and one last thing before we dive in, I just wanted to thank our sponsor today. Uh, today's panel is sponsored by the Canadian Latinx Theatre Artists Coalition, Caltech. Thank you so much to Caltech on behalf of LMDA Canada and LMDA. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. Uh, and so I figure we'll just dive in and I'm just going to go um, with the, the way that the, the your little rectangles are on my screen and I'll just kind of go in order there. And so that means the closest person to me is Pedro right below me here. Pedro, would you like to start us off? Now, Pedro, I believe uh, yeah. you are coming. You're coming to us from Armstrong. Is that correct? Or? Yes, I, I am um, coming to you from the interior of British Columbia on the Silk and Sequemic uh, lands, also known as Armstrong, BC. I'm at the Caravan Farm Theater in a writing residency currently. So, yeah, thank you. Um, we're on Elon Musk's uh, Starlink internet. So, uh, if, if I drop out at any moment, it's because it's satellite internet and it is, is not the most reliable. 
Um, so thank you. Uh, yes, so I am Pedro Chamale. I do uh, make and live on unceded and ancestral stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, uh, also known colonially as Vancouver, uh, and, but originally from uh, Treaty 8 territory in northern BC with my parents who emigrated from Guatemala. Uh, so I am the co-artistic director of Rice and Beans Theatre, which has a multilingual mandate uh, to also explore form and uh, kind of the stories of where we come from and where we go. Um, that's kind of really briefly who I am. I'm a playwright, I'm a director and, and performer as well. And recently I have been working in um, uh, dual languages along with programming uh, of doublespeak, which looks at multilingual language in uh, Canadian uh, works, but also in a self-reclamation of language uh, by um, learning, taking lessons, and writing in Spanish, and, and then also in English, and incorporating those two halves of myself that I feel I am neither complete of both, but have foots in either circle. Um, yeah, and the latest project I worked on was actually with one of our fellow panelists, Daniela Dencia, uh, where we worked together, and Daniela was my Spanish language dramaturg. Uh, as I was writing Spanish into the project, um, it, that project was called Made in Canada, an agricultural operetta, where I interviewed uh, migrant temporary seasonal agricultural workers, primarily from Mexico. Uh, and so a lot of interviews had to happen in Spanish, um, which I was capable of. But when Daniela came on, those interviews only got better. Uh, <laughs> and, and then we took those verbatim interviews, uh, news articles um, around the seasonal agricultural workers program, and we put them uh, into song and into scenes, which then due to the COVID pandemic, we transformed into a song cycle with our composer, Michelle Cutler, and our Mexican composer actually, as well as we found along our journey, Rey Alegria, and we, uh, and it's available to stream on Spotify. That's, that's, that's about it. There's my little quick intro. Thank you so much, Pedro. Uh, next on my screen, we have Carmen. Take it away, Carmen. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm joining you from the unceded land of the Squamish Nation, which is also known as downtown Vancouver. And I come from Chile, also known as Walmapu, in Abiyayala, uh, Latin America in the Guna language. Um, I arrived here as a child as an exile, um, fleeing the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile. And all of my work it comes from that lens, uh, from the lens of being an exile as opposed to an immigrant. So an exile is a person who dreams of their return to the homeland. An immigrant is a person who reinvents themselves in the new land. Um, so, even now, as I speak, uh, you know, I am still in exile and, um, I think there's not a lot of us writing about that experience in Canadian theater. There's a lot of immigrant stories, not a lot of exile stories. Uh, so I came to the theater here in, in Canada in 1990, which is when I started going to theater school. Uh, of course I was, you know, the only Latinx person in my theater school. <laughs> And uh, I'm the first Latina woman to ever have graduated from that school. Um, so my um, journey through the theater, it has been a, a long and treacherous one. Uh, I began in theater school to be a very outspoken activist for um, racialized voices, uh, which were lacking in the Canadian theater. Um, so. I could talk about what I'm doing right now, and I'll do that for about two seconds, because that's very easy to find if you read my bio, for example, right? Uh, but I'd rather talk a little bit more about the 90s, which you won't find in my bio. So currently, I'm a core artist at Electric Company Theater based in Vancouver. I'm also um, an associate, uh, oh, cripes, I forgot the, the name of the title. Artistic Associate of New Play Development. Uh, sorry, Bob, I know you're watching. Um, at the Stratford Festival. 
and I'm writing uh, about four different plays right now, uh, an adaptation of Medea, an adaptation of Moliere's uh, The Learned Ladies, uh, that was for the Factory Theater in Toronto, um, and uh, an adaptation of a book called The Many-Headed Hydra for Stratford. Uh, a couple of other things, which uh, again, you could just find on my bio, but I wanna go back to the 90s. Uh, so the work that Pedro was talking about is so exciting to me, um, and it has a long history. So uh, one of the things that I did in the 90s was I started a group here in Vancouver in 1994 called the Latino Theater Group. And for about a, uh, eight years, which is how long it lasted, uh, we had about 120 members. And what I had done is I had trained in theater of the oppressed with a local company here called Headlines Theatre Company, later called Theatre for Living, and with Augusto Boal in Brazil and in the United States, and with a, 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 a Victoria-based company called Puente Theatre, run by you know pioneer and uh, Latinx uh, theatre artist here in Canada called Lina de Guevara, who is now about 88 years old and still very active. So uh, it was through the Latino Theater Group that uh, we presented about 25 short plays all over uh, Vancouver and two full length plays, all based entirely on the participants' lives and all completely bilingual, right? All in Spanish or English based on who the audience was. And the interesting thing about this group was that it was very purposefully for non-actors and for marginalized uh, youth uh, from Vancouver. So most, I would say pretty much all of them, no, that's not true, most. Most of the uh, members of the Latino theater group were also exiles. That was the demographic in the 90s in Vancouver, the Latinx demographic were exiled people from uh, Central America and from South America. And of course, many, many, many undocumented people who crossed the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. It was so great to hear Sabina talk about that in the keynote um, uh, on foot, you know, and some and walked to Vancouver and were still undocumented. So that's what the plays were about. Uh, I, I feel like I've gone on too long, so I'll stop there. I just wanted to uh, express how. Um, what we've been doing certainly here in Vancouver, what Pedro was talking about has deep roots and I'm always really, really happy to uh, see new generations like Pedro, like Daniela continue um, with that long tradition. Thank you so Thank much, you. Carmen. Um, so next on my screen, we have Didanli. Take mm -hmm. it away. Thank you, Catherine. Um, bueno, yo voy a hablar en español. Eh, mi nombre es Didan Wikient. Soy mexicana, eh, vivo en la Ciudad de México. Eh, soy eh, investigadora en artes escénicas, historiadora del arte. Mis intereses, sobre todo, han estado eh, siempre vinculados al tránsito entre artes. Me interesa de manera específica los estudios intermediales, los estudios performativos. He desarrollado mis investigaciones, sobre todo en ese ámbito, y de manera especial las manifestaciones relacionadas con el sonido. Eh, la, escena, la escena creo que tiene siempre una dimensión sonora, que es poco atendida o menos atendida de lo que quizá debiera. Y para mí ha sido muy, muy interesante trabajar, sobre todo en esta capacidad eh, de agencia performativa, también de lo sonoro en términos sociales, políticos y culturales. Y bueno, eh, trabajo, trabajo eh, como profesora de tiempo completo en el Colegio de Literatura Dramática y Teatro de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Eh, uno de mis mayores eh, placeres es la docencia, es el espacio del aula, pero me considero sobre todo también una espectadora, siempre digo que con picazón cognitiva, es decir, con mucha fe de comprender el fenómeno de la escena y me interesan entonces los espacios de mediación, en especial la relación espectador-escena. Eh, soy coordinadora del aula del espectador del Teatro UNAM desde hace varios años. Eh, coordino un grupo de investigación que es el Seminario Permanente de Estudios de la Escena y el Performance, en donde se congregan personas de diferentes disciplinas interesadas en 
investigaciones sobre la escena. Y eh, he trabajado también como dramaturgista en algunos procesos, pero sobre todo me, me, me interesa siempre todo lo que tiene que ver con relaciones de investigación. Actualmente eh, coordino junto con Jorge Dubati el Diplomado Internacional en Creación e Investigación, eh, en donde estamos creando redes de investigación también eh, en toda Latinoamérica. Me he tenido sobre todo mucho trabajo en relación con, con Chile, con Argentina. Eh, mi mirada ha sido quizá más cercana hacia el sur. Por eso también el día de hoy hablo en español. Me siento con una responsabilidad eh, de nombrar de nombrar también desde, desde el español, desde los matices y la fuerza performativa que tiene la palabra dicha eh, desde la lengua materna. Y bueno, estoy muy contenta de, de estar el día de hoy eh, dialogando con todas y con todos ustedes. Muchas gracias, Danui. Uh, so I'll be going back and forth with the, in, the wonderful web switcher pro. So I'm sorry if there's a delay there, <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, up next on my screen, we have Emilio. Emilio, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. I'm Emilio Mendez, he, him. I'll be talking in both English and Spanish, which I do hope it's not hectic, but dramaturgical. Um, I, I'm a professor of theater studies at the National Autonomous University of Mexico at UNAM. Um, uh, I've also worked as director and translator. Uh, I hope that uh, sort of opens some questions further on. And for a decade now, I've tried to study and explore with students at UNAM the, the benefits of dramaturgical practice, um, not just in terms of uh, how to foster and empower the students at UNAM to generate their own poetics, but also how to best discuss the way to elaborate their own artistic policies. Uh, I do believe dramaturgical work is essential for the consolidation of the work in the cell of a company. Eh, entonces, he tratado de, de explorar con eh, alumnas y alumnos de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México cómo para consolidar sus compañías hay prácticas del llamémosle dramaturgismo en español, que también pueden eh, ayudar a, 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 a involucrarse más con las comunidades en que están generando el teatro que generan. Eh, esto en dos sentidos. Uno, entendiendo que teatro también es una dinámica, es un, es un término fluido, quiero, quiero concebirlo así, el teatro no solo es el teatro profesional, el teatro es también el teatro que se hace en comunidades muy diversas, que, que puede tener intenciones no necesariamente comerciales. Eh, y, eso, y eso implica revisar nociones eh, muy presentes en las prácticas dramaturgísticas, como el concepto que sí me parece complicado de traducir al español, que es outreach. I do believe dramaturg outreach is the key element to, how to best put it, to best accommodate what dramaturgy means all over the world into Mexican theatrical cultures. Uh, because uh, in Mexico, many, many theater groups are limited to whether they receive or not subsidy. So I do believe one of the most powerful ways to make the most out of those of subsidies is through outreach work. Through outreach, I do believe we make the most out of the subsidy, but, but even if, if there's not subsidy in any theater company or theater group, uh, I think that dramaturgismo 
el dramaturgismo nos ayuda a hacer preguntas fundamentales que eh, me emociona mucho poder estar compartiendo con todas y todos ustedes hoy, eh, en, en, reconociendo la genealogía de lo que nos tiene hoy aquí, reunidas y reunidos. Me emocionó mucho escuchar eh, a Mark Bly, eh, que dio su testimonio de sus primeras aventuras por acá, en compañía de la maestra Silvia Peláez y de la maestra Sabina Berman, pero también eh, me, me siento muy persuadido a intentar traducir el trabajo de Michael Mark Chemers eh, y de su pregunta crucial, Why this play now, which I have attempted to translate into Spanish, para qué y por qué, no solo por qué, para qué y por qué esta obra aquí y ahora, para esta comunidad. Y es en ese, es en ese espíritu que, que pues me siento muy emocionado de poder estar compartiendo con ustedes esta mesa que me emociona mucho. Gracias, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Emilio. Uh, so up next on the screen, we have Daniela. Daniela, take it away. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, hi, everyone. Hola, todos. Mi nombre es Daniela Atiencia. I think I will also go the bilingual route uh, because it's very much part of my identity. Uh, nací y crecí en Colombia. Viví en Colombia hasta que tenía 19 años. Eh, mi mamá es canadiense, mi papá es ecuatoriano. Entonces crecí en un hogar bilingüe. Y a los 19 años me fui a el Canadá a estudiar teatro. Eh, y desde ese entonces, pues el teatro ha sido parte de, de mi vida. Eh, I am a freelance director and dramaturg. And I uh, am also a divisor, which means I create theater from scratch. Um, if I'm going to talk about myself specifically, I'd like to hone it in on the lens of dramaturgy because um, it's a topic I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and I, I mostly like to think that dramaturgy exists everywhere. And so I'm, I'm very much interested in dramaturgy and non-conventional spaces. Um, but if we're thinking about uh, the theater, uh, lately I've been applying my dramaturgical skills in um, language. And this has uh, taken um, a variety of forms. Uh, mostly it's been uh, supporting artists in uh, their different processes of where they're at with language. So, um, for example, as Pedro mentioned, we had a, a great collaboration. Uh, he already had a dramaturg in English, but hired me as a Spanish language dramaturg to focus in on the language specifically of Spanish. And we were able to collaborate together on what that meant and what that looked like. Um, but I've also collaborated with Paula, my fellow panelist who's here today, uh, on uh, work that she's done on translation and looking at her own translation and figuring out how it's fitting into a bilingual play as well. So um, I like to think my work is uh, intersectional uh, because that's how uh, I was raised. And I'm very interested in language and translation, but in also in cultural exchanges uh, like this one. And I'm fascinated about uh, how dramaturgical practice is being um, explored in other countries. And um, I'm also passionate about um, encouraging my fellow artists to uh, see themselves as dramaturgs. I think um, Pedro and I have discussed this, especially within the Latinx community. I feel like many people are dramaturgs, but they don't see themselves as one. Um, and I think that they are. And uh, I'm interested about opening up that conversation and feeling like they have ownership over um, the, the quality and the way that they're observing and making deep analysis about work. Um, and I'm very intrigued about how dramaturgy is practiced in Mexico specifically for this panel. Uh, anyway, I could keep going and I'm sure we can have lovely chats about this, but um, that's, uh, that's a little bit about me. Muy gracias. Thank you so much, Daniela. Uh, last but not least, we have Paula. 
Hola, um, soy Paula Zelaya Cervantes. También me voy por el, el camino bilingüe. Um, I'm a Mexican playwright, director, and translator. I, I live in Mexico City. I went to school in Canada for a university. I was there for five years and then came back here. So I, I got the chance to meet a lot of wonderful Canadian artists um, while I was training to be a theater um, person and then came back to Mexico to meet um, and theater um, makers in Mexico that I hadn't met before. Uh, before my, my university experience, I'd never really met theater people at all. So I first met Canadian uh, theater artists and then came to Mexico to collaborate here. Um, one project that I've recently been working on um, is a play that I wrote, co-wrote with uh, a friend of mine, Ana González Bello, um, which was born in Spanish. It's interesting that um, we mentioned La Lengua Materna uh, just now, because um, this play was born in Spanish, we wrote it in Spanish, and then almost immediately had to translate it into English because we had the chance to take it to New York to um, a, a festival. So we took it there and we had one show and then we uh, kind of submitted it for a couple of prizes. It won the Latino National Playwright Award in, in Arizona, the Arizona Theatre Company, and then a Tom Hendry's from, from Playwrights Guild of Canada. But all of these um, kind of awards and readers of the play were all English speakers and had come into contact uh, with the play in, in English. And recently, um, about a month ago, we opened the show in Espanol. Y um, lo, lo tradujimos al español en el año pasado, pero no había tenido oportunidad de que se encontrara con su público, el público eh, que, que era la intención que, que entrar en contacto con la obra. Y me llamó la atención lo emocional que fue eso y lo diferente que se sintió eh, presentarlo finalmente en el idioma que, en el que había nacido y aparte para el público. Es una obra muy mexicana, habla de un superhéroe, de su hija y de el, el heroísmo en, en tanto a lo entendemos creo en México eh, con la, la política que tenemos, con nuestra historia y entonces fue increíblemente aterrador mucho más aterrador porque nos sentíamos un poco más responsables del de mensaje, creo, y eso no me lo esperaba, aquí que allá. Entonces creo que en, en esta como intercambio o esta, esta plática de, sobre idiomas y sobre eh, cruzar fronteras, para mí fue cruzar una frontera no solo de lenguaje, sino emocional a la hora de escuchar la obra en español por primera vez eh, para el público al que iba. Este, so I was really... It was surprising. That's why I'm talking about it today, because I'm still surprised by the feeling and, and the weirdness of it and um, the fact that I never expected to to affect me that way. Um, and so that's basically what I've been working on lately. Um, I worked with dramaturges for a long time in, in Vancouver and then kind of stopped when I came to Mexico. And only recently have I contacted one to uh, start work. Uh, with him on a new play, and I'm really excited because it's a part of me that I kind of left behind and I shouldn't have. And so this is, this is really exciting, um, being invited to speak here, uh, just at the point where I'm about to start um, working with a dramaturg, a young Mexican dramaturg, who's amazing, and maybe I'll get a chance to talk about him later. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Wow, I'm. I'm just amazed at this panel. This is such a, a fantastic group of people. I, I so many places where we can just kind of dive in and where do we start? Um, you know what? I'm going to start with a very general question, um, which might be boring and vague, but maybe it'll open the door to more specific um, things. I'm not sure. Um, so a few of you have spoken about specific projects. Um, that like involved cultural exchange, like Paola, what you were uh, just speaking about, and uh, Carmen, what you were mentioning as well. Um, I I want to hear more about these about these projects. Um, so the question that I have is like, what is a project that you've been particularly proud of, or um, that was particularly challenging that involved cultural exchange? And I actually I kind of wanted to take that to Pedro and Daniela uh, specifically. Because I, I personally am very curious about uh, Made in Canada and how um, the kind of English and Spanish language dramaturgs worked together or or not, or how that was approached. If you're open to it, maybe we could start there. Sure. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question for that project specifically because um, that play was uh, how developed with many partners, 
um, they had a resident, I was at the Banff Playwrights Lab as a playwright and the PTC Playwrights Theater Center was a uh, company collaboration. And so with that company collaboration, um, their uh, dramaturg Kathleen Flaherty worked with me on that piece for a number of years. And so when, when Daniela, when I approached Daniela um, about working on that piece, because I, I needed the care for, right, um, not by my choice of having been born in Canada, um, I just, I needed a greater care and respect for that, that language that I need, that needed to be in there. And so then I approached Daniela and then that was her question is like, how is this going to work, uh, Daniela? Yeah, um, there was, you know, as Pedro said, already a, a dramaturg uh, associated with the project. And um, if there's anything that I that I love about theater and doing my work is um, and dramaturgy is like how when I get to be specific about something. So um, actually, this this was ideal because uh, you know, as as dramaturgs, sometimes we have to focus on like the larger scale and the bigger picture. Uh, but in this instance, I was actually able to just hone in on um, uh, the 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 language, the Spanish, uh, how it was serving the play, what it was doing, and um, Kathleen also felt supported because then mm -hmm. she could relax and let me um, focus on the on the aspects of of the play that was in Spanish. Um, but it, I would say it was a, it was mostly a collaboration uh, with Pedro. You know, we would just sit for hours and discuss about one word. You know, he he's coming at it from you know his his Guatemalan Spanish, and I've got my Colombian Spanish, and so it was also uh, a, a una conversación cultural entre nuestros países, nuestros idiomas, nuestras expresiones, y tratar de decir también eh, si usamos un un uh, español más neutral o si tratamos de pensar en los personajes porque eh, la mayoría eran de, de América Central. Entonces, um, sí, se desarrollaron unas conversaciones muy interesantes acerca del, del dramaturgismo dentro de una obra bilingüe y, y, y qué decisiones se tenían que tomar para que igual el público pudiera uh, captar la esencia del idioma. Sorry, I was just listening to the end of that there. That's that's fascinating. <laughs> um, I actually I just wanted to follow up question, uh, quickly since uh, Danielle, you were you were just speaking. Um, there's an incoming question for you if you like. Um, in the chat here, it says, Daniela, can you speak to the non-conventional spaces where you see dramaturgy? I I was going to hone in on that too. That's that's fascinating to me. Oh, can of worms. Um... <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, uh, take over. I just think that, um, my, my brain is, I think, wired dramaturgically. I'm, I'm highly analytical. I'm always analyzing and observing. And so, um, I, because theater is my world, I think that I, uh, apply naturally my dramaturgical lens, uh, to every aspect of a show. And that, that starts with, um, how how are um how are audience members entering the lobby what kind of experience are they having at that point um the dramaturgy behind the marketing um but also uh you know having dramatur dramaturgical conversations with um lighting designers and sound designers and everyone behind the scenes so not just applying dramaturgy to uh the play and the script but um uh, applying a dramaturgical lens uh, to all all the other aspects of theater. Um, y pues el otro lado es que me encanta tener estas conversaciones eh, con con personas que no están en el mundo del teatro. Pueden ser eh, ingenieros o arquitectos eh, que también uh, pienso que uno le puede aplicar un un uh, Sí, este lens de dramaturgismo a otros espacios que no son del teatro y así también poder hablar de, de lo que hago porque no, no es fácil explicarlo a veces. Entonces eh, también me, me gusta poder hablar con otras personas que no están en el mundo del teatro y, y poder eh, aplicar esta forma de analizar 
las cosas y la vida eh, en ámbitos fuera de, de mi mundo. Danielle, that reminds me of when uh, we were working in a box office together. <laughs> we talked about the dramaturgy of patron services, yes, which is exactly a whole other can of worms, like you said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fascinating. Yeah. We we could have a whole panel on that if we wanted. Yes, that's oh, yeah. exactly what I mean. Next time. Yeah. Next time. Um, now, Dijanwi, there's a question coming, like the questions are starting to roll into the Q&A, so I'm just going to dive on those. And I, I do see one for you, and I did a, a quick Google translation, and I'm pretty sure it's asking about um, if you could speak to your dramaturgical work with the dimension of sound in theatre. Is that correct? Yeah. Take it away, Dijanwi. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Katharine. Um, bueno, eh... Quizá antes de contestar la pregunta, eh, contestando un poco también a la pregunta que hacías tú respecto a cuál ha sido algún proyecto eh, un que, que haya supuesto un desafío eh, en, en transfronterizo, eh, quisiera, quisiera mencionar eh, como desafío especial para mí eh, Fui gestora, coordinadora y curadora del último encuentro del Instituto Hemisférico del Performance y Política que se llevó a cabo en la Ciudad de México hace, en el 2019. Y probablemente ha sido, eran eh, alrededor de 700 académicos, artistas y activistas de 23 países distintos. Eh, fue un desafío mayor en muchos sentidos, ¿no? En muchos sentidos porque... Eh, la mayor parte del encuentro se llevó a cabo en la ciudad universitaria, en la UNAM, y entender esta traducción de institucional de los, lo, lo que se hace, lo que se puede o no hacer en un espacio, las connotaciones que tiene cada uno de los espacios, cómo gestionar, eh, trabajando con todo el equipo del Hemispheric Institute, y también con colaboradoras y colaboradores de tantos países, fue para mí de una enorme riqueza. Y lo traigo a colación por esto que mencionaba hace un momentito Daniela. Creo que hay eh, como actos dramaturgísticos, como el de la gestión, en donde la investigación se pone al servicio de esta comprensión de un todo, eh, que no tiene que ver con la producción, sino con una sensibilidad de, de interpretar y de comprender los distintos universos culturales para ponerlos en diálogo. Eh, para mí, el, el, el ser curadora del EMI y organizar, que llevó además dos años de gestión, implicó eso, dejarme atravesar por otros esquemas, permitirme pensar desde otros lugares, investigar muchísimo, eh, y un poco eh, un encuentro es una puesta en escena también, ¿no? Y bueno, sobre el dramaturgismo en relación al sonido, es curioso porque yo eh, comencé la relación con, con la escena, eh, sobre todo como investigadora. Mi tesis de doctorado es una tesis sobre la promesa y la promesa rota en distintos fenómenos del Don Giovanni de Mozart, vinculados al Don Giovanni, a la ópera. Eh, y luego tuve la oportunidad de trabajar como dramaturgista eh, en, la, en una puesta, en un montaje, bueno, desde la creación primera de la ópera Titus, con un equipo de colaboradores chilenos, con Guillermo Eisner, compositor chileno, y Carla Romero como directora. Bueno, eh, creo que la primera vez que pude poner en práctica, más allá de una investigación académica, esto fue justamente en Titus. Eh, y bueno, yo considero que hay mucho de la escena que se dice a partir de la, de la por ejemplo, haciendo la, la, la adaptación del texto de que hubo mucha investigación que hacer ahí, que le hicimos colaborativamente, la adaptación del texto de Shakespeare hacia la ópera, bueno, de entrada tiene que salir mucho de la palabra que va a ser dicho con la música. Pero concretamente el tema, por ejemplo, de la viña, que normalmente después de que es, eh, le cortan la lengua y queda muda, en cualquier representación casi de, de esta tragedia tan sangrienta de Shakespeare, eso es lo que aparece. Como nos interesaba y le interesaba al equipo hablar 
justo de este Titus, no desde la perspectiva de Titus, sino desde la perspectiva de la viña, fue muy importante todo en, en el proceso de investigación lograr encontrar la posibilidad de que esta lavinia no quedara muda, sino que no pudiera pronunciar palabra, pero continuar haciendo lamento. Eh, esto desde el contexto, además, de violencia, de feminicidios que vivimos en México. Entonces, eh, bueno, ese es un ejemplo, ¿no?, de, de para mí lo que articula eh, una imagen intermedial eh, desde la investigación para llevar a la escena eh, desde un qué se quiere decir con un equipo además de colaboradores, bueno, maravillosos, ¿no? Yo, yo, yo daba material, hablábamos mucho sobre la voz, textos, etcétera, pero quiero decir, fueron soluciones a las que fuimos llegando en un proceso de investigación compartido y que tienen mucho que ver directamente con el tema del sonido. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and thank you for kind of tying it back to my other question as well. Like that, that sounds like a, that's a fascinating um, process and to work with those images and, uh, and how it relates to, to like your research and how it relates to sound like that's. Wow, that's fantastic. I'm sorry. My dog is next to me. She cries out. Yes, Carmen. Yes. Oh, good. I was, I was, I was now, now you can hear me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just jumping on, on, on the whole question of dramaturgy. I mean, 1 thing that I know that we're discussing in Canada. And I'm curious as to whether this discussion is also going on in Mexico. Is also the question of cultural and political dramaturgy. Right? So, uh, for example, uh, right now, uh, at, at, um. I'm sure I'm allowed to say all this, Bob. No, maybe I'm not. Uh, no, I think I am. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Stratford is about to premiere uh, a play. I don't think it's the world premiere, so scratch that. It's about to produce a play called um, uh, Serving Elizabeth by this fantastic Afro-Canadian uh, playwright, Marcia Johnson. And the play takes place mostly in Kenya. And so one of the, the, the dramaturgs that's going to be in the room for this uh, production is the fabulous uh, Mackenzie Muzioki, who is my fellow uh, artistic associate of New Play Development, A, because he's a brilliant dramaturg, and B, because he's Kenyan. So he is able to bring the, you know, the cultural dramaturgy into the room, right? And for me, I always... Uh, also, uh, look at my particular projects through a political dramaturgic, dramaturgical lens. So, for example, my last play that was up uh, is called Anywhere But Here, and Pedro and Daniela worked on it very hard. Thank you so much for working on that play. It was a world premiere by Electric Company. And uh, the political dramaturgy of the play uh, was we are here so it was about um exiles and refugees to, uh, mostly taking place at the u.s mexico border so uh, almost all the characters in it were latin latinx and almost all of them well all of them were uh exiles and refugees uh i needed to be sure dramaturgically that um the uh theme of it was we are here because you are there and that is an actual line in the play, right? We, us Latinx refugees and exiles, are here in North America because you, North America, are there, right? Uh, so I needed to make sure, uh, along with my dramaturg, Heidi Taylor, who's incredible, and she's the artistic director of Playwright Theater Center, um, that that political dramaturgy was threaded throughout the entire play, that we never dropped that, uh, uh, that lens, that anti-imperialist lens, right? That I, I wanted to make sure that the play was not um, an immigrant story, right? The immigrant story of North America that you see on stage is being, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us in. Yes, my uh, global South country is a piece of shit. I'm so lucky to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful. My global South, South country is backward and stupid and static and, 
you know, kind of like an Orientalism, right? Um, so it was very important for me that that political dramaturgy, as well as the cultural dramaturgy, right, um, was very present during the process of writing and during the rehearsal, along with the director, making sure every beat of the play, nope, right here, we're dropping that uh, that lens, that anti-imperialist lens. How do we put it back in? How do we make sure that nobody in the audience, and it still happened, right? That nobody in the audience sits there going, oh, these characters are so lucky to be in North America, as opposed to the audience members going, oh, these characters are here because we are there. Shit, okay, let me think about that. Uh, I, I've gone on too long, but I just wanted to bring that into the conversation and, and wondering if that's, um, if those kinds of conversations, si ese tipo de conversaciones que acabo de explicar están tomando, eh, se están haciendo, se está, están teniendo ese tipo de, de, de conversaciones, ustedes, colegas que están en México y en el sur. Yeah, I'd like to offer any of the our Mexican panelists to, to respond. Is there, are there similar approaches to dramaturgy and, and to your work? Um, yeah. If I jump, may I jump in just very quickly? Yeah. Because uh, what excites me about hearing uh, 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 Carmen's perspective is what excites me and sort of, I also regret to, to, to acknowledge this, but in many sectors in Mexico, in my opinion, we don't have to fight the politics of theater making in order to include cultural and, drama, and, and political dramaturgy. Uh, básicamente a lo que me refiero es a que en México pervive de una manera muy fuerte la jerarquización de la práctica teatral en la que la voz de el director, casi siempre varón, casi siempre el hombre director, es la Trinidad, es la voz de Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo, es el pozo infinito de sabiduría, somos un país profundamente católico, y esta lógica de que quien dirige una obra tiene el saber y el poder absoluto en muchos ámbitos de la producción es algo que ha costado décadas pelear, décadas ajustar, décadas bring into question even. O sea, incluso cuestionar esa práctica ha tomado mucho tiempo. Eh, sin embargo, creo que a través justamente de un programa como el de la UNAM, en que eh, eh, tengo el privilegio de ser colega de, de Didangui, ha empezado a haber una transición en que cada vez más permea lo que escucho con emoción de, eh, de Daniela, de Pedro eh, y de Carmen. This is a collaboration. And indeed, even the stage director is another collaborator. It's not the holy trinity of theater. It shouldn't, it shouldn't still be regarded as that. So uh, for me, that's the first step. Uh, hay muchas compañías que ya ven su trabajo desde una transversalidad, eh, desde una horizontalidad auténticamente colaborativa, y entonces sí se suma el componente de el dramaturgismo político cultural. Solo quisiera poner un ejemplo porque me llamó mucho la atención en The Keynote eh, que la maestra Sabina Berman eh, ponía el ejemplo de the mythification, the mythification of the Indian in Mexico. I do believe that uh, the Indian is mythified both by stagecraft and, regrettably still, by statecraft. Uh, entiendo la razón para empoderarse mediante la designación mestizo, pero también me apena mucho reconocer que es en este año, en el, el año pasado, en el 2020, fue la primera vez que en este país se incluyó una pregunta en el censo nacional que permitía a las personas afrodescendientes autoidentificarse como afrodescendientes. Y en México se ha también, there's a mythification of the term mestizo. Because 
mestizaje has been since the 19th century at least a very comfortable policy that has tended to marginalize and even invisibilize afro descendants in mexico uno de los ejemplos eh, es muy común que una persona afrodescendiente en méxico sea vista como extranjera eh, Didangu y yo tenemos una colega en la universidad, la profesora Muriel Ricard, que en colaboración con, eh, eh, ay, estoy olvidando el nombre del director, discúlpenme, quizás, I'm fighting towards the hierarchy, but they have indeed collaborated very, very closely, both as a performer and as, well, this has been, this has been a continuum. They devised this story called Angelique, and I'm sorry for the spoiler, but Angelique is a black performer, allegedly, allegedly uh, touring. Uh, she's, alleged, she, she's an allegedly French black performer touring Mexico, facing discrimination all over the place. And through a very interesting and compelling musical dramaturgy, both the performer and the director asked, well, do we want to tell the tale from the revictimization of Afro descendants in Mexico? Or, or do we want to bring this into question while still having fun? And they devised a, a, a one woman show, a, a piece of cabaret theater, a, a piece of musical theater in the whole extent of the word of the term. Through boleros, uh, La Sandunga, La Llorona, uh, chansons by. Um, uh, Edith Piaf, they started to tell this story about a black foreigner in Mexico, and I hope they forgive me, but this, this is the point, how they address the political dramaturgy of it. In the end, the audience learns that she's not foreign. She's from the Mexican state of Oaxaca, and she has to pass as a French woman in order to, yes, be exoticized, so to speak, but to have a voice, because for centuries now in Mexico, it's kind of OK if you have a darker skin color, but you must be foreign. So uh, Carmen question re really, really uh, sort of uh, excites me because this is the questions we should be making here. First, sort of revise the political hierarchy of theater making in many, many places, in many, many companies, in many, many industries, in many industries in Mexico, the theater industry as a whole, but also how we should be asking this sort of, this sort of question. So I hope I, I sort of follow up on that. That, that makes me think of exactly why we decided to have this conversation because it seems like there are very similar questions and uh, like you said restructuring of hierarchies happening here in Canada or that like needs to happen here in Canada and maybe is some resistance you know um oh this is this is fa this is fascinating <laughs> thank you very much for that um now did Don, I saw that you had a hand up at one point Donwin did you want to respond to that as well um, if not, that's okay. There's another question in the chat that we can go to. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, okay. I thought I saw a hand up. All good. Um, so there, okay, so this question is from Marta, um, and I think it kind of ties back to what we were just saying, and I'd like to kind of flip it to both sides, because it's a question for um, the Canadian panelists. The question is, what is the perception of Mexican theatre in Canada? And for Carmen specifically, like, how has it changed over time? But I'd almost want to flip that to say, like, what's the perception of Canadian theatre in Mexico as well, if there is any? Um, so I'd like to throw it up to whoever would like to respond to that. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll just jump in. Um, I think that there is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, colleagues, uh, but I think there is no perception, perception of Mexican theater in Canada. I think it's completely non-existent. Um, you know, um, 
I, I, I hate to say it, but I think it's there's zero perception of what Mexican theater is in Canada. I think that um, there's misconceptions as well, like about certainly the global South and Latin America in, in particular, right? Uh, be, just because that's what we're talking about right now, that there is no theater there. It's like, what? There's theater there? What does it look like? What is it? You mean like there's actual like huge theaters? <laughs> you mean like there's a huge theater scene just just like anywhere else in the world, right? There's mainstream theater, there's underground theater, there's devised theater, there's theater of the oppressed, there's et cetera, et cetera. There's like a shock that that even exists. You know, you, you know when I talk about corrientes, which is like the the Broadway of um, of Buenos Aires, right? And I describe corrientes to Canadian colleagues that it's like the Broadway of, of Buenos Aires where you see Broadway type shows, a lot of them are shocked that that even exists, right? Uh, I hate to say it, but that, that, that's, that's the reality. And the struggle for us Latinx artists here in Canada, as I know you know, Marta, has been for us to actually get work in the Canadian theater. Because I, I, I would bet not money because, you know, I can't give, get it to you right now, but uh, I would bet whatever that in Mexico, uh, when people think of Canadian theater, they don't think of people like me and Daniela and Pedro. You guys probably think about white people, right? When you in Mexico think about Canadian theater, you're probably thinking about white plays and white people. You are probably not thinking Daniela Atiencia, Pedro Chamale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're not thinking that, right? Um, and so there's a problem there, right? There's there's a, a big border there. And I think the border is political and historical, you know? Um, Latin America, as we know, is not a race, it's an ethnicity. However, it is a racialized continent, right? When we view it from the North, right? It is a racialized continent because of a long history of imperialism that continues to this day, right? So uh, because of all everything that I'm just saying, the struggle for us Latinx artists here in Canada, I'm sorry to say, has not been to go, hey, everybody in Canada, let's look at Mexico and see what theater they're doing. No, our struggle has been much more day to day, like shit, how do I get a part? How do I get work? How do I get my lens? You know, my Latinx lens on stage? How do I get Latinx stories on stage about Latinx people who are in Canada, right? How do we reach our Latinx audiences in Canada, right? Knowing that much of the Latinx population in Canada is poor, much of it is undocumented. How do we get to them? So we're not so concerned about how do we get Mexican plays you know, uh, translated into English and then put them up here, right? That that has not been our concern. It's been more about how do we, we Latinx people in Canada, uh, confront uh, erasure and systemic racism in the Canadian theater, you know? Um, so that's, that's what I have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if I could add also, I think to think of, Canadian Latinx artist, it's this country is so large and our our percentage of demographic, uh, let alone the percentage of Latinx artists in theater is so small that our it's the connection that we're craving because we have historically related from each other just live you are in the country like with um, we're finding members, there's the one lone uh, Mexican artist in Saskatoon, right? And so if you, you, there's, uh, alone, you don't have that power. And so creating these organizations, we're trying to raise awareness simply to the fact that we are here, uh, stop ignoring us. And, and so, and hopefully one day we can achieve a momentum, then that momentum can create the bridges to the, the, the South. And, and to have that stronger exchange, hopefully. For me, I don't know, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but. <laughs> yes, did I? Sí. Um, yo creo que en México pasa un poco lo mismo que comenta Carmen, ¿no? Eh, no, no, no es que haya una idea 
eh, del teatro canadiense en general. Creo que, y, y pasaría sobre todo eso, una imaginación genérica, ¿no? De imaginar como una escena, sobre todo, eh, quizá incluso cercana a, a la misma dimensión en la que se tendría la escena estadounidense. Eh, sin embargo, creo que, eh, hablando de una forma un poco más local, sí me gustaría eh, comentar que el Festival Internacional de Teatro Universitario, que tiene desarrollándose ya desde hace varios años eh, en el marco de la UNAM, eh, ha tenido ya varias veces intercambios con Canadá. Y a mí me ha tocado ver ahí teatro canadiense. Eh, tanto por intercambio, digamos, con eh, escuelas mexicanas, pero también me tocó hace un par de años, o tres, estaba buscando el dato ahora, pero no lo recuerdo, que se abriera justamente este festival con una obra canadiense, Le Sang, eh, La Sangre, eh, que fue, fue interesante porque además estaba justo en aquel momento eh, Hans Thies Lehmann, eh, impartiendo un curso, entonces bueno, yo tuve la oportunidad de ver junto con Lehmann aquella obra que se eh, autodenominaba como postdramática y que generó una grandísima incomodidad dentro de la audiencia este, del teatro aquel día. Fue para mí muy interesante el fenómeno, porque era un grupo de estudiantes de preparatoria eh, canadiense con una especie de reformulación de varias cartas del Marqués de Sade era una obra muy interesante, pero que efectivamente estaba poco relacionada, o sea, poco enterada del contexto de la audiencia con la que iba a dialogar aquella noche. Eh, estábamos teniendo justo en esas semanas, además, habían aparecido una serie de crímenes de feminicidios tremendos. Entonces, la audiencia lo percibió como una agresión enorme, ¿no? Eh, porque era como, ¿cómo, ¿cómo pueden venir a hablar...? aquí, este, digamos, como desde un lugar de un erotismo exacerbado, eh, que era lo que sucedía ahí, como, como exacerbando la violencia. No es que fuera realmente así, pero fue un encuentro interesante, digamos, en términos culturales. Eh, fue rico que al día siguiente, en el curso que teníamos con, con Lehman, eh, fueron estos chicos a hablar sobre la obra. Entonces, fue, fue riquísimo escucharles, porque claro, sus motivaciones, el, el, todo el universo que ellos tenían, de hecho, tenía todo un pronunciamiento político en ese sentido también y ético respecto al cuerpo. Sin embargo, eh, esa traducción no se alcanzó a ver y a sentir eh, en, el, en el público mexicano, ¿no? Pero fue muy rico poderlo dialogar ahí. Fue muy rico también poder deconstruir que pues realmente no tenía nada de pues, dramático, ¿no? Eh, etcétera. Eh, creo que a mí me, me sirve eso para hablar respecto a qué sucede en el momento en el que más allá de ideas generales, yo, yo sí creo mucho siempre hablar desde el conocimiento situado, ¿no? desde la, la territorialidad, pero también sobre todo desde las micropolíticas que se dan en la escena. Es decir, no podemos hablar, seguir hablando de esta cuestión tan universal, sino de un montaje específico, un público específico, un momento específico. Y para mí eh, pienso en Intercambio Canadá-México y recuerdo aquella noche aquella noche y toda, todo lo importante que fue también para este grupo de jóvenes canadienses escuchar lo que su obra podía detonar también, cómo podía ser leída desde otro lugar, ellos además con una gran apertura para escuchar, entonces fue, fue rico, fue, fue un intercambio creo que muy productivo y creo que eso ocurre cuando, cuando, cuando nos reunimos a sentir y a pensar el teatro. Wow, that would be, well, like you said, that would be quite an experience for a group of like high school students to to see their work kind of like reflected back to them. Like, wow, that, thank you for sharing that. That was very interesting. Um, there's another question just that popped into the chat here. Um, and it's, are there any works that any of the panelists have worked on that notably bridge the gap? or beginning the work of bringing the gap um, of bringing Mexicana or other Latinx work to Canada. And I almost wanted to direct that to Paula, because I, I wonder if that um, relates to the project that you were speaking about before, that, you're, that you've started working with a, a Mexican dramaturg and when you're kind of going back and forth between Vancouver and, and Mexico. Um, if you're willing to speak to that. 
Yeah, sure. Um, the play I was uh, talking about before is a different play. Um, the play that uh, we staged first in Canada, it was kind of like this back and forth crazy thing, um, is the Orb Weaver. And there was actually a question um, about that, so I can probably talk about that as well. Um, this play I, I wrote while my, at my last year in, uh, of university in, in the University of British Columbia. Um, I wrote it and then with a couple of friends from university, we just like staged a really experimental weird version of it that completely changed afterwards. Um, and then it was really interesting. Um, one of the people involved in the project was my really good friend, Matthew Willis, who was acting as dramaturg um, at the time. It was funny because I, I was dramaturging his play and he was doing mine. And so we would spend like entire days, like eight hour long days, just talking back and forth about theater and, and our plays. And then I came uh, back to Mexico to live. So this was like my last few months in, in, in Canada. And I was uh, developing the play further. And I had the help um, of Kathleen Flaherty from Playwrights Theatre Center. It was only like one or two like email, um, like an exchange. And what happened was that she asked four or five really difficult questions. And I spent like six months crying over them and freaking out. And they were so helpful so helpful to um, it just it just made me realize just how much I needed um, that help. It's really interesting uh, what Emilio was saying before about um, kind of challenging this idea of like this director figure um, person that I had absorbed my whole life. Like you think of a director and it's this guy and he knows everything. And so trying to fill those shoes has been incredibly scary and just not helpful. And my journey through theater has been deconstructing that idea that as a director and playwright, I have to be the one person who knows everything because it's really hard and it's just not true. Um, so with this play, what I found was first in Matthew and then Kathleen was kind of like um, company um, that, that would be with me uh, developing the play and being responsible somehow for the play. And I was not the sole creator of the thing. Then we, uh, here in Mexico, I was working with uh, my, my producer, Jimena Saltiel, who's uh, an amazing theater producer. And she acted as a kind of non, she, she wasn't aware of it at the time, but she was acting as a dramaturg as well, um, asking questions about the play and then um, kind of asking me to, um, to apply for the Vancouver Fringe. Um, we applied for it and then the play, which was born in English uh, and was then performed by Mexican uh, artists, uh, Mexican actors was flown back to Vancouver um, with a team, a design team that was all Mexican with Jimena, who's also Mexican. And the only, I think the only Canadians involved were uh, Matthew and, uh, and the UBC Players Club um, who were producers for the show as well. Um, this university club helping us produce. And it was really interesting to see how that experience further developed the play. We, we couldn't, taking it across the border. We couldn't really, it's a play about people killing people, so we couldn't really take a lot of the props through um, immigration and the airport because that would have been really hard. We ended up um, making a lot of the set pieces from junk that we found on back lanes. Um, Anna, the actor who got there earlier, went, uh, Matthew took her on this like tour through the Vancouver back lanes trying to grab suitcases and stuff. And what was interesting there was that we found the place aesthetic um, basically through not being able to do it the way we wanted it to. And in the, that, that happening, we realized that the play was, a play was meant to be made through junk and through the things that we stole and, and borrowed from, from. So that was really interesting um, and just how the play ended, ended up developing. And then we, la trajimos de regreso a México um, y en ese caso tuvo un efiteatro um, y en 2018 se presentó en el Teatro Helénico eh, Y fue maravilloso ver cómo algo que había sido de pedazos de caja de cartón y demás, tener el dinero para poderse producir eh, como queríamos, pero informado por las dificultades previas. Eh, y ese proceso creo como que mi idea inicial de lo que es un director, un, una dramaturga, se destruye mucho en estos como procesos que me he encontrado con que lo haces en partes. Nunca va a ser perfecto a la primera Eh, esta idea de que tienes la respuesta correcta de inmediato tampoco existe y entonces estos procesos en pedazos difíciles en los que hay muchas personas eh, colaborando, en los que traes este ida y vuelta, o sea, contar la historia de Dilador, de York Weaver, es una historia larga porque justo tiene esa como, como todas estas líneas que se cruzan dentro de ella eh, y de entender la obra que escribí cuando tenía 23, a, ahorita que tengo 30, 
eh, y entender lo que sentía del, del idioma inglés cuando le escribí ahorita que la verdad es que escribo en español, ya no escribo en inglés casi, este, y, y entender ese viaje a la hora de traducirla, darnos cuenta que su público final también era el mexicano, más que el canadiense, aunque en su momento le escribí para los canadienses, no me puedo quitar de encima lo que soy, ¿no? Eh, entonces, descubrir que su público finalmente siempre fue el mexicano fue muy interesante. Y sí, ha sido un proceso que sigo entendiendo el de no tener, eh, por eso la idea de, de Emilio me llamó mucho la atención, esta figura de lente que sabe todo, y más bien creo que estos procesos de dramaturgismo, de que sea difícil, increíblemente difícil, y que muchas personas estén metiendo su cuchara y que eh, no nazca de un solo evento, sino que aparte se informe de las diferentes, eh, sus diferentes viajes. En, en la obra hay un, hay un momento de un viaje, los personajes viajan de un mundo de cuento de hadas a la realidad de la Ciudad de México y cuando se presentó en Vancouver a la realidad de Vancouver. Y creo que se informó mucho ese viaje eh, a través de los viajes que hicimos físicamente subiéndonos al avión. Creo que no hubiera escrito un viaje si no hubiéramos necesitado ese viaje de Vancouver a, a México. Entonces, simplemente me parece interesante ese, como el entendimiento de cómo las obras, pasando por fases de ese tipo, crecen de una forma impresionante y además destruyen la idea de que yo como creadora tengo que poderla sacar completa como, como es, cuando no es verdad. Eh, y hay tanta gente involucrada y además creo que es bastante terapéutico para, como creadora, saber eso, ¿no? Esa es como mi experiencia como de entender también terapéuticamente como creador que no, no es necesario esta, esta como única voz, sino voces. Y entonces ese fue el proceso de The Orb Weaver. And I, it's one of the things that I'm proudest of because we were okay with it not being okay until it finally was. Thank you. That to me is su such a great example of how like literally crossing borders, the theme of this conference, uh, influences your work as an artist, um, like your like identity as an artist and like your artistic process like that. That to me is fascinating. Uh, and now I'm realizing we only have about two minutes left. Um, I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to like summarize our discussion. I feel like we've really just scratched the surface. I'm hearing uh, a lot of like similarities between like what's happening up north, uh, like up here and what's happening in Mexico. Like the common things I'm hearing is um, like how people define dramaturgy and define themselves as dramaturgs and almost need a little convincing in, in that regard or need to be convinced that they work dramaturgically or are a dramaturg. In my work as president of LMD Canada, I'm always trying to convince people to join and they say, oh, but I'm not a dramaturg. I'm like, well, you don't know it, but you are. And we all kind of work dramaturgically to an extent, right? Um, and we can benefit from this like network of people, um, which is essentially why we wanted to bring uh, this panel together um, so in our last minute or two here, I wanted to thank you all and I wanted to offer if anyone had any like parting words or um, anything they would like to leave everyone with or gosh, if we need to do like a part two of this conversation, maybe next year or something or um, if anyone has anything to share um, or any last questions or anything, please, please take the floor. Eh, pues yo solo quiero decir, oh, perdón Emilio, me demoro 30 segundos, simplemente que es un gustazo para nosotros en la comunidad latina poder compartir esto con, con, con ustedes en, en México, eh, es un honor realmente, espero que estos intercambios eh, puedan suceder con más frecuencia, porque realmente, por lo menos yo y creo que Carmen y Pedro también sentimos como el, el hambre de poder conectar con, con una comunidad latina, y, y saber eh, eh, esas conexiones que ustedes tienen con, con el mundo, con el teatro, con dramaturgy, eh, me siento muy inspirada. Entonces, eh, nada, simplemente agradecerles por, por compartir este espacio con nosotros. Emilio, did you have one last thing? The, the, very quickly, uh, just as a follow up of what Dan we said and Carmen, uh, for a certain generation, of theater makers in Mexico in the late 90s and early 
21st century. Actually, Quebecois theater was the sort of inescapable thing. Uh, Michel Marbouchard, Larry Tremblay, Carole Fréchette, Geneviève Billet, and John Mighton were the playwrights that were being translated and staged here in Mexico. And as, as, um, as Paula just said, for a generation of theater makers here, that was part of who they became or who they want to become. And I think at this moment, it would be thrilling to have uh, uh, Carmen's, Daniela's, uh, Pedro's work being translated perhaps by Paula and staged here. Because as uh, Carmen, you really moved me to think, yes, we were doing plays by Quebecois playwrights. And although I might be mistaken, all of them white. So the thing has to be, it, it has to be kept moving. And I do believe that this very panel is a very promising path to keep the conversation going. Thank you. Wow, thank you. If, oh man, if, if something came out of this, like translations or exchange, like that to me is a big check, a big success. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Uh, oh, Brenda's popped in. I'll, I'll leave it to you, Brenda. Hello, thank you, Catherine. Didn't mean to interrupt, uh, but what a fantastic panel we just witnessed. Fue un panel increíble. Sí, creo que deberíamos tener una segunda parte. This will inevitably happen. Y eh, muchas gracias, Carmen, Pedro, Dani, Paula, Didanui, Emilio, Catherine, por supuesto. Uh, I just want to let the attendees know that now we're having a break for lunch. And if you want to join your regions for that lunch, we're very pleased to have you. Tenemos lunches regionales. Eh, México está en una de las regiones, así que los mexicanos o los que hablen español que quieran unirse a este lunch, bienvenidos. Muchas gracias por estar en este panel. I will see, I will see you all soon. Thank you very much.